working with the strike. We have details for you as the teachers express good faith as they return to the negotiation table. Also this afternoon, consultant psychiatrist calls for a national framework to deal with drug abuse as Joy News' hotline documentary shows how some people in the creative arts industry are battling addiction and substance abuse. We need to have stand-alone drug addiction rehabilitation centers. Plus, some persons who showed interest in contesting the upcoming Ejusu parliamentary by-election recent decision with just few days to the by-election. We'll take you to that constituency for more. We also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and next spaces are joining us on TV. My personal handle is Adenana Aisha. Please do stay for details. <laughs> The three striking pre tertiary teacher unions have this afternoon called off their ongoing industrial action, citing an injunction secured by the National Labor Commission against their actions. The three teacher unions have since March 2020 2024 stayed out of the classroom, demanding improvement in their working conditions. King Ali Awudu is a spokesperson of the three teacher unions. Well, Nagrat President Angel Kabono has, however, described the NLC's decision to go to court without notice to the striking unions as an action in bad faith. We call on the leadership or the management of Ghana Education Service, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Labor, <coughs> and also Fair Wages and Salaries Commission to commence negotiations immediately. And not only commence negotiation, but will be seen to work in such a manner that negotiations will end in the interests of the Ghanaian teachers. And any act that goes to court without the other partner is an act in bad faith. Hmm. Away from that, authorities at the Teaching and Holy Family Hospital have expressed concern over the increasing number of tuberculosis cases in the municipality with the facility recording 65 new cases between January and March this year, a sharp increase from the 2022 figure of 45. Facility TV coordinator Godfred Amankwa, who disclosed this to Joy News, said the facility is increasing its sensitization campaigns to help curb the menace. Anna Sabet has more. Tuberculosis continues to be a significant public health problem in major parts of the world, with Ghana recording over 19,000 cases in the year 2023, a sharp increase over the 2022 figure of 16,500. Here in the Tichima municipality, the situation is equally worsening with the Holy Family Hospital recording a total of 64 new cases between January and March this year, an increase from the 2022 figure of 45 cases recorded within the same period. Godfrey Amonkwa is a TB coordinator here at the Holy Family Hospital. Last year, by this time, we were having about 45 cases. From January 2024, we have 64 new cases of the situation, according to Godfrey, is largely due to the location of the Techiman municipality and the influx of traders into the Techiman central market. Northern region, Savannah region, and even when you are moving towards Western region, and Western region, you are moving to the market. And because we have a bigger market, we are in the middle of it, so our risk is higher. The facility is with support from the Regional Health Directorate, increasing awareness on the need for the public to look out for their TB statuses as a means of helping keep its spread. Our thing for this year's Phyllis Amoyi is a health educator with the Holy Family Hospital. She admonishes the public to visit health facilities for TB tests should they experience chronic coughs. 
TB can affect other organs in the body, like the kidney, the liver, the other internal organs that makes people move as a human. So we are advising anybody, wherever you hear my voice, to go and test for TB so that it doesn't affect the other organs in the body. Rebecca Edu has been coughing for some days now. She took advantage of the screening exercise to know her status and urges all to do same. <laughs> Anna Sabit, Joy News, Teaching Man. Sultan Psychiatrist at the University of Health and Allied Sciences, Dr. Eugene Dodoi, is asking for a framework to deal with drug abuse. His comment follows a Joy News Hotline documentary, Creative Addictions, highlighting how some people in the creative arts industry are battling with drug abuse. We'll hear from him shortly, but first, excerpts of that documentary produced by Kwame Dadzi. For most people who use illicit drugs, they start as children or teenagers. The late Lynx Entertainment signee O.J. Black is one of those who got trapped in the act when he was but a little boy. Uh, I started smoking when I was very young, very, very little. I started at the age of 11. 11 years? Yes. Who introduced you? No one. How did it happen? Uh, so I was in the boarding house and um, sometimes you see the security, what we used to call watchmen, yeah. smoking around, I mean seated in their jackets smoking and and I was, I was, I was talking to one of my friend who was like, hey Charlie, you see the way this food is smoked, you know? It was like, oh you, you, you go feed smoking. And that was how it started. I want to sing for the world, sing for my country. Good, good. So if I sing and you don't pay me, yo, I don't lose. If you know what you are doing and what the talent is and what it's worth, it's not what the peanut the person is going to give you. Good. The Nasty, a former member of the Lifetime Family Music Group, tells me that his relationship with drugs was best during his time in a disadul college. Little did he know that what made him high for a moment would ruin his life forever. This whole thing started in school. You understand? This whole drug thing started in school. I said it and then this school guy is listening to me, Sally, I'm out. And I'm trying to say about my life story uh, that, that these two guys are telling me that because I went to the I'm sending the Southern College guys out. But I, I'm not going to lie. I started this drugs around <laughs> at the year 19. I was a little kid. I was a little bit stubborn because Sally, over she's jot, and your she bet you and your she run and you need something strong. I don't worry. So far as my motive is to stop drugs. I don't want any drug conversation because right now yeah, yeah. I'm, it's, I'm trying to say no to it more than going to rehab or they should tight me. They don't want me. You understand? Say no to it. You have the money in your pocket. You say no. You buy it. That is real rehab. Dr. Julius Hatcher says drugs impede the normal functioning of the brain. Um, the whole concept or the whole idea of drug is that it has got a biological basis. Addiction now demonstrates a biological basis, making it clear that any time that anyone uses any of these drugs or substances of abuse, the brain itself gets affected. It halts the maturation of the brain. And to some extent, it even causes the brain's maturation to regress. So certain social skills that you would expect that a person will acquire at a certain stage because of the use of drug, they may not gain or acquire it. That notwithstanding, the general perception that drugs boost the confidence of creatives is rife among entertainers. 
We can now hear from consultant psychiatrist at the University of Health and Allied Sciences, Dr. Eugene Dodoy, who wants the state to pay particular interest in dealing with the situation. As a country, we still do not understand addiction, okay? So drug addiction is not, it's considered a brain disease. So, and for every disease in medicine, it means we have a way to manage it. The way to manage drug addiction is not one. So when it comes to opioid addiction, we have another medication that can block the feeling of high so that people stop using. When it comes to alcohol addiction, we don't have a drug for it, but rather we use what we call psychotherapy. So there are different ways of managing addictions and there are different types of addictions. And we have to adopt it as a country that, hey, this is what we want to do. And this is what the way we want to go. Currently, apart from the, I mean, psychiatric hospitals, there are no other government or, or publicly funded agencies to manage substance addiction. We don't even train the people to, to go and manage them. And when you manage substance addiction in a mental hospital, you create what you call a double jeopardy because mental illness is stigmatized. Addiction is stigmatized. Then you put the addict who is not mentally ill, but have drug addiction as a disease in a mental hospital so that everybody say that, yes, they have a mental disorder. They also have addiction. I mean, why give them what they have not bought? You know, so we need to have standalone drug addiction rehabilitation centers. Former Chief Executive Officer of the Mental Health Authority, Dr. Aquisio Seonis Pat, is pushing for the implementation of a mental health levy. He considers this as crucial in the development of mental health in Ghana. Speaking at the launch of a book, Letters of Hope to My Younger Self, spearheaded by Abakato Ando and Zoe Baraka, Dr. Se emphasized the importance of a political will in supporting this initiative. Dear Mary, you're nine years The old. book, Letters of Hope to My Younger Self, featuring letters written by prominent Ghanaians to their younger selves, was spearheaded by Abba Ketu Anda and Zoe Baraka. It aims to inspire and uplift today's youth by sharing the wisdom gained from life experiences. Speaking at the launch, Abba Ketu Anda emphasized the importance of activities like journaling in promoting mental health. It's incumbent upon us to talk about mental health, talk about ways of strengthening our mental wellness. It's a hygiene, it's like, like hygiene, like physical health, mental health and wellness is a, involves practices. You know, physically you get up, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, practices. Spiritually, you say your prayers and so on, and that's spiritual health. But for mental health as well, there's specific practices that one should practice, not just when the times are tough, but every day, you know, uh, and, and these are things like journaling, learning how to express your feelings, learning how to, when things go bad, reframe the situation and find the good in it or the hope for a better tomorrow. Zoe Baraka highlighted the role of reading and building a mentally resilient society, urging increased government investment in this area. I'm so glad she talked about journaling, and that's what storytelling does. When you, when you hear other people's stories, it gives you hope to realize that you too can get out of where you're coming from. So honestly, when you asked about what we would recommend to the government, is to honestly pour a lot of money or resources into reading and into libraries and into uh, giving people the power to be able to share stories in safe spaces. Former head of the Mental Health Authority, Dr. Kwisiose, called on the government to show commitment to mental health policies and laws, including passing the mental health levy for improved services. We have a mental health law. We have a mental health policy. All it requires is for us to adhere to the law, adhere to the policy, and we are through. Everything we need, we need to ensure mental health is taken care of is there in the law or in the policy. 
but the, the political will for us to implement, that is what is lacking. For instance, the law talks about the implementation of a mental health tax or levy, and we don't have the will to implement the tax. I know this is not the best time to talk about taxes. Uh, the president is trying to remove a lot of taxes, I know. But this is a tax with a difference, a tax with a difference. And I believe that if you ask any average Ghanaian that what you make out of a tax to help with mental health care, everybody will say, let's have it. So we need to have the will to implement the tax. Once we implement it, and we implement all the aspects of the law and the policies, we are good. He also lauded Abakato Anda and Zoe Baraka for spearheading the project. So this is a great book because it gives insights to our younger colleagues, our younger selves, what it is, the experience they require in life. As they are growing up, the mistakes we made in life, which we would want them not to make similar mistakes. So it's a wonderful book, a book. it's a great book. And as it, it, it settles your mind, it also helps with your mental health. Because everything you do is your mind. If your mind is at peace, you are also at peace and everything will move fine. So it's a great book that I recommend to every young person growing up. Contributors to the book include legal practitioners such as Ace Anan Ankuma, Robert Ni Adeklek, Joyce Ba Mukhtari. They shared their personal struggles and successes, offering valuable insights for the younger generation. Special aid to former President John Mahama Joyce Babuk Tari says she's proud and happy about what her younger self was able to achieve. I'm living all the dreams of my parents and I wish my father had lived long enough to see me and see all of us. But my biggest inspiration will certainly always be my parents, my mother in particular. I celebrate her each and every opportunity I get because she believed in her daughters. She gave us every opportunity and opened every door that she possibly could to the baking, to the shena, to the creams that she was making, to the clothes that she made for us. I am today my mother's daughter and largely my father's daughter. The National Commission for Civic Education is asking the National and Regional Houses of Chiefs, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, as well as the Department for Social Welfare to ensure that the best interests of the, ch of the child are protected and child marriages are removed from our customary practices. A statement signed by Chairperson Kathleen Adi uh, reads, and it's on your screens uh, shortly, the NNCC... Uh, e is appalled by the recent announcement by the Nungwa Traditional Council that a 12-year-old girl has been betrothed to a 63-year-old Babulomo of Nungwa, Numo Pokete Lawechu. The commission wishes to express concern about this development and emphasize that cultural practices that are illegal and unconstitutional have no place in our democracy. The NCCE wishes to remind the Ghana Traditional Council that the Children's Act, Act 560 of 1998, Section 13, 1 and 2, provides that the minimum age of marriage of whatever kind shall be 18 years. It is also worth pointing out that the same section of the Children's Act says no person shall force a child to be betrothed, to be the subject of a dowry transaction, or C, unclear to the NCCE, uh, or C, person shall force a child to be, be th to be married. While the Nungwa Traditional Council contends that this union is voluntary, it is unclear to the NCC how a pre uh, preteen minor can consent to such an arrangement. The 1992 Constitution of Ghana recognizes and even encourages Ghana's many ethnic, ethnic groups to practice and extol their culture. However, the Commission calls on the Nungwa Traditional Council to note that same 1992 Constitution in Article 39 also states that traditional practices which are injurious to the health and well-being of the person are abolished. Furthermore, for over a century, our courts have held that traditional practices that are contrary to natural justice, equity, and good conscience are outlawed. Well, on the AM show this morning, lawyer Dennis A.J. Jumo and former Gender Minister Nana Oye Bampo Aro shared their sentiments on this. If you want to incorporate in Ghana, you should be 18 and above before you can incorporate in Ghana. And in terms of children, 
the law in looking at the best interest of the child has insisted that marriage of whatever kind, be it mm. marriage to the boss or married any form of marriage, a child cannot, and the law says any marriage whatsoever kind, a child cannot be involved in that. So a person who is less than 18 years cannot marry. He, he or she cannot marry. That's the laws of God. Now, what makes it interesting is that remember that you yourself had the conversation that this appears to be a controversial conjugal relation. And once conjugal issue comes in, the, the definition of marriage by law is an aspect of conjugal duty, and that is sex, simply put. It, it, it means that you can still be held liable. In, First of all, let's determine it. Was it married? Even if it was married, it's a criminal offense to marry someone who is a child. That is an offense by itself. Now, when it comes to conjugal duties, the right to have sex starts in Ghana after 16 for a, a female. Okay? What it means is that if you have sex with anybody below the age of 16, a female below the age, you have committed defilement because the law foresees that. A child below the age of 16 lacks the requisite requirement of even giving consent. And the children ask for that goal that even if when the person is between 18 to 21, even if you gain the, the right to, to have sex after 16, you can marry before 18. If it's between 18 and 21, you still need the consent of your parents to marry. Now, one of the, one of the critical aspects of marriage is the consent of the parties involved themselves. So you're asking yourself whether this 12-year-old, and, and this for both customary law and ordinary marriage, because remember that marriage is also a liberty issue. Can this 12-year-old, is it in the best interest or best way for this 12-year-old, whether he's betrothed or married, to be given away? This, can this child be in a position to give his consent mm. to this yeah. event? And these are the questions that we may have to look at. First, determine whether it was married. Even if it was betrothal, you can't force a child to be in betrothal. Three, even if it is customary, the customs of the land is subject to the laws of God. And, and I believe that it is no, it's the, for this reason that the framers of the Constitution place the mandate of National House of Chiefs to evaluate and try as much as possible to codify the customary laws and try as much as possible to eliminate any customary laws that seek to be archaic and inimical to the child. Because these obligations are the part of the, it's not only statutory, it's also international obligations and the United Nations Convention as well as the African Charter of the Child. So, so, so but you can't suspend, otherwise you don't marry. Then why don't you wait for the child to be 18? Uh, constitution is clear on customary practices and what the balance is. Article 26.2 says, as a country, we prohibit harmful customary practices. Let's assess whether this is detrimental or not to the upbringing and development of the young girl. So our laws are very, very clear. When you get to our policies too, in 2016, President John Ramani Mahama, globally and regionally, came up with a plan to reduce and, and end child marriages in Ghana. And we were one of the top five countries in the African region spearheading this campaign. From 2016 to 2026, we have come up with a strategy. We have a framework strategy on ending child marriages in Ghana, supported by UNICEF. So in terms of where we stand as a country, as far as child marriage is concerned, it is clear that what happened on the 30th of March, whether betrothal, whether uh, marriage, is unlawful and is a crime. And I'm happy that the Ghana Police Service and the Gender Ministry have taken steps, have taken steps to um, rescue the child and mother and investigate. But then we have more issues and questions. Can you imagine what the family, the immediate family are going through? I am, I come from Nungwa also. My grandfather was a kingmaker, Jengewe. 
even for me at my age and everything, it's 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 a big issue uh, for me to speak to this. But what is the law is the law. What right. is our value is our value. And we must speak to this and we must say that this child cannot be married. It is a crime. The National House of Chiefs, Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, and the Gender Ministry, Department of Social Welfare must step in. The best interest of the child is what we are looking at. And on your election headquarters, Ashanti Regional Chairman of the NPP, Bernard Njibu Esiako, has confirmed some persons who showed interest in contesting the upcoming Ejisu parliamentary by-election have rescinded their decision. It comes after a meeting with party leadership in the region. Many party members have shown interest in the seat following the demise of the MP John Kuma. Mr. Njibu Esiako reveals the internal mechanism established to reduce the number of aspirants has yielded some results. Posters of about 10 people have been cited on social media ahead of the opening of the nomination today. I've been joined by my colleague, uh, Nana Eaojima, who's following this for us for more. Nana Eaojima, uh, is there any reason why these people have rescinded their decision to contest? Nana Eaojima? Exactly. Information that we have so far is that the... Hello? We can hear you. Uh, Go ahead, have... Nana Ojima. Nana Ojima, you are live. Go ahead. So the information we have is that the constituency chairman is one of the people who has rescinded decision to contest in this um, primary. Um, inform earlier, it was in circulation that he is also interested in becoming the member of parliament or the uh, parliamentary candidate for the new patriotic party in the adjusted uh, constituency. But after the negotiation that um, um, they had with some of the leadership of the party in the Ashanti region, he is among the people who have rescinded decision to contest in this race. I understand that there are other people who have also rescinded their decision, but they are yet to make it clear. Um, before, before today, um, about 12 posters had been cited in the Ejoso constituency and also on social media, and all these people had shown interest in becoming parliamentary candidates or um, in um, becoming the next MP for the Ejoso constituency. And today, these people, those who think that they are still strong enough to go into this race, will, will come here into the party office of the Adjusto constituency to pick their nomination forms. And um, so far, there's only one person that has been cited here, and he's in the person of Dr. Evans Dia. He is in the party office, and um, very soon we, we understand that he will meet the committee and pick his forms and um, hope that he gets the nod to to be the next member of parliament for the Ejoso constituency. Mind you, Ejoso is an MPP seat and it's one of the areas that the NPP has been able to win massively when it comes to elections in the Ashanti region. But Aisha, I would want us to go through the 12 people who earlier we had information that they would want to contest, even though some have rescinded the decision, we expect that at least five people will go ahead with plans to um, take over from um, the doctor, John Kuma, who is now deceased. Now, um, we, we know that the former GFA boss, that is Mr. Kwesi Nyantechi, also has interest in the adjusted seat. Um, we know that the um, the the assembly, the, 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 the the current presiding member in the Ajusso Assembly is also interested in the seat. Other host of people within the Ajusso constituency, including Mr. Kwabena Boatin, who is the first vice chairman of the NPP in the Ajusso constituency, is also interested in becoming the member of parliament of the parliamentary candidate for the new patriotic party in the Ajusso constituency. So there have been several names out 
and they are all hoping to be members of parliament or the parliamentary candidates for their Jusu constituency. As you can see, um, the supporters of Dr. Evans, they are, uh, are all here, they are on the grounds, and they are awaiting Dr. Dia, who is currently in there, meeting the committee that is in charge of the um, nomination and the processes. So immediately he, he is then will try get an, uh, um, an interview uh, from him. So far what we know is that the constituency chairman has rescinded decision to contest in the race. A GISO constituency will be finding out who will represent the NPP in the by-elections on the 13th of April. Let's take a break on joining us today. When we return, there's more. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the business segment on Join News today with me, Pius Kojo Baka. Ghana will today undergo scrutiny over its performance under the IMF program. The mission has arrived in the country to carry out the review for the next two weeks. My colleague George Yafe has the rest of the story. The team is in town for this assessment after Ghana passed the first review completed in January this year. The engagement will start today is expected to end next Friday, April 12, 2024. The team will engage officials of the Bank of Ghana, Ministry of Finance, the Presidency and some civil society groups when it comes to those technical and policy issues. On the actual assessment, this will be based on how Ghana has fared for last year, ending December 2023, when it comes to those targets, monetary policy issues and the structural benchmarks. The governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, and the Minister of Finance, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, are all optimistic that Ghana will pass this review based on how the country has fared over the last half of 2023. This could trigger the release of some $360 million by June this year, subject to the IMF board approving the second review. This would be the first of two reviews that will take place this year whilst the other one will happen in November 2024. Ghana, since it signed up to the IMF program, has received $1.2 billion. This review could also see Ghana coming out of the terms and deal that it has reached with the bilateral creditors and euro bond holders. Interest rates have taken another nosedive for the 13th consecutive week in 2024. However, the government's Treasury bill target was oversubscribed by 50.96% because the Treasury decided to keep the yields down in order to reduce the high cost of borrowing. More in this report. According to the auction results by the Bank of Ghana, interest rates continue to tumble in line with the disinflation process. The 91-day bill fell by 25 basis points to 25.74%. The yield on the 182-day bill also plummeted by 28.24% from the previous weeks of 28.49%. Similarly, the 364-day bill also went down by 25 basis points to 28.84%. Last week, the government received an inflow of $300 million from the World Bank for budgetary support, a move that compelled the government to reduce its borrowing on Treasury market. Meanwhile, the T-bills auction surprisingly fell short of its target by 50.69%. The government got 2.354 billion Ghana cities of the total a bit standard. Chunk of the bid standard came from the 91-day bill. About 1.705 billion cities was offered, and the government accepted all. For the 182-day bill, 510.34 million cities were the bid standard. The uptake was 510.34 million Ghana cities. Also, the 364-day bill saw about 138.10 million cities of the bid standard. 
Ghana's interest rate is currently roving around 29%, sparing high cost of borrowing regime for the domestic business environment. According to the managing director of the Ghana Stock Exchange, Abinamwa, this puts Ghanaian businesses as a, um, a disadvantage compared to their foreign counterparts. She spoke to Joy Business here in Accra. The high inflation and interest rate environment in Ghana has meant that many of our Ghanaian companies are essentially working for the banks. Our markets will never grow if our macroeconomic environment isn't right. Our fixed income market, whether it's government or corporate, won't work until we have sustainable and a low interest rate regime. Because you can't compete in Africa if you are borrowing at 30%, and your colleague in Nigeria is borrowing at 11%, or in Kenya is borrowing at 6%. Our Ghanaian institutions won't survive. And so we need low inflation, low interest rates, and sustainable for a long period. So someone can actually come and say, I'm taking 10 year paper, and you are confident that if you give 100 CDs today in 10 years, you come back in 10 years and it's not worth one CD. But maybe if it's worth 90 CDs over 10 years, but the interest you've, cov you've uh, collected over the 10-year cycle means that your overall return in 10 years is 150 CDs. It's worth it. If we don't get this right, all of us, our contributions will look outside of Ghana, go and develop other countries' money, and there'll be no jobs, there'll be no employment, there'll be no goods and services. And that's it for business. I am Pios Kojo Baka. That will be at 1 p.m. with the marketplace. Sports is next. Time now to bring you sports here on Join News today. I am Muftar Nabila Abdullahi, the local organizing committee chairman for the African Games 2023. Dr. Ofuso Asari has called on the government of Ghana not to give the infrastructure constructed to organize the event to the National Sports Authority. The National Sports Authority is a government agency responsible for the maintenance of sporting infrastructure in the country. But in recent times, they've been censured by the general public for how they have maintained various stadia in the country. And Dr. Fusasari believes that handing those facilities which organize the African Games to the National Sports Authority is tantamount to handing them to an institution that cannot maintain even its house. For what I term as the PPP model, that's the public-private partnership. Uh, because I come from uh, the corporate world where results are very paramount. And based on our history, if we don't adopt such a model and make it self-sustainable uh, commercial-wise, we will we'll be declining into the system where we term as white elephant things deteriorating and all that we spend enough money that's the taxpayers money there were opportunity costs we could have used the money for other things so having used this money to to do all this we have a responsibility to maintain these facilities so let's do it in a commercial way where we'll be able to sustain and uh, for instance if we are to build a university of sport for development people will come there and pay Around it, people can build posters, people can build entertainment centers, people can build things that will be very, very, will, will transform the place and make the place like a, a sports hub, entertainment hub, a place that will be a, a, a tourist attraction. People will want to come here and go there and see what is happening there. If you leave it in the hands of government, government will not be able to mobilize resources to do all this. Not the NSA. No, I don't think so. I'm not arguing for the NSA to take over. Why? Because after 2008, what has happened? It is not because the NSA has also been irresponsible. We have to also say that. Because the NSA has also not been really seriously resourced to handle some of these things. One has to be fair. And so I will want this model, I will want us to go for this model. And the president also has, also, uh, he challenged us that we should transform the facilities of the University of Sports. In his last uh, speech during the closing ceremony, I mentioned it, and he also mentioned it, I should say. And so it, it is something very dear to him. And, and knowing him very well, I know that he will ensure that we will build this university. 
Joyce Force understands that the Court of Arbitration for Sport will give its verdict on Georgia Free Year's disqualification from contesting the GFA presidential elections in October last year. That ruling is expected to come out on May 13. We we'll have details of this story and many more on myjoyonline.com. We appreciate your time. Good afternoon, welcome to the show. This segment with me, Jacqueline and Samaya Boa. After all the religious activities, all roads led to the Kumase Retro Park on Easter Monday for the 2024 Lava from Easter Family Party in the park. With all the fun filled activities, the park saw scores of family units bonding and making merry while celebrating the death and resurrection of Christ. Thousands of patrons who trooped into the park were entertained to super thrilling activities. My colleague Nana Boache has more in this report. So the Kumasi Rattery Park is definitely where you have to be every Easter Monday just because it is the Easter edition of the Lava FM family party in the park. This year's edition has been amazing with a number of patrons moving into the Kumasi Rattery Park to have fun from the adults corner to the swimming pool to where we have the games for the kids. We got interacted with some patrons who came in to the Kumasi Rattery Park and this is what they had to say. I came with my kids, that's the family and they are, I think they are now okay, they are enjoying themselves. You know usually with work we don't even get time to take them out so if we get opportunity like this uh, we bring them out so that they can also have fun with their colleagues. And then how are they enjoying the moment? Oh, I could see them going around what they cannot do in the house since they are out they are doing it so I'm happy. Oh very fantastic, very fantastic. I'm very very very, very happy, I'm very happy. You came here with your family? Yeah. How many? We are seven. We are seven. And how are how, how all of them feeling? The feeling is great. Oh, very nice. Very nice. In fact, uh, since in the morning, everything has been so smooth, peaceful. Uh, the security here is so nice. In fact, uh, they are guiding us. And, and I can tell uh, everybody here that they have to come here and enjoy themselves. Well, we're playing games and having fun. Um, the first time that I came, it was uh, nice and um, I felt happy. You're happy? What have you been doing so far? Just playing ball and jumping on the trampoline. Okay, and so we are seeing you next year, right? Yes. To have an experience of swimming, so I just want to swim. That's why I came here. How are you? Oh, fun. How has it been? Are you having fun? Yes. You came here with your mother. Yes. And you are enjoying it, right? Yes. Say hello. Say hello to everybody watching you. Say hello. Look into the camera and say hello. Say hello to everybody. Hello. Bye bye. The Kowu 2024 Easter Festival has wrapped up, leaving Kowu buzzing with stories of adventure and fun. From paragliding on the Ojanama Mountain to lively nights in Kowu Obome, here's a scoop of all the excitement you might have missed. Kowu was the place to be over the weekend. Imagine soaring high above Kowu's stunning landscape, feeling the wind rush past you as you glide through the air. Thus, what thrill seekers experience at the Kowu Paragliding Festival. Feeling so good back home, you know. So every year I'm quite in Kowu for the celebration of Easter. For the past seven, eight years, I'm always home. Wow, for the what, Easter what celebration. is the thousand for that? For the vibe, because I love it here. You meet different people, you meet new people, you make some friends, new friends. Also the food, the, also the carnival and the jams is also very perfect. Um, basically, um, this is like my best experience ever in life. Because it's an experience that you should not go, for, uh, go and forget about it. Yeah. So it's been like one of my best experiences. I would have loved to do it again. Uh, well, how do you feel? You're about to fly. How do you feel? I'm excited. It looks fun. It looks fine. Yeah. You're not scared of it. No, I'm not. Great scenery, I guess. And like, I don't know, a nice view. The nature is amazing, like so green, so windy, the, the weather is super nice, yeah. Are you coming back this year for the Easter? Maybe, yeah. 
And guess what? The only Ghanaian pilot there shared his thrilling ride with us. Okay. There's nothing too strange about it. It's just a sport you learn, you know, just fly like that. You come with expectations. Then everything depends on the weather. Everything. So when the weather is good, we just go fly. Then, when the sun set, Kau Obomain turned into Party Central. The streets were alive with music, laughter, and good times. <laughs> become the go-to spot for adventure junkies and this year was no different. As the festival lies dim and the last party goers head home, Kwewu whispers a promise until next year when the fun starts all over again. For Joy News, I am Jacqueline and Suma Yabua. It's a wrap for the showbiz segments with me Jacqueline and Suma Yabua. Aisha, you missed a lot. You didn't take me with you. Next year, we're going together. I can't wait. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us showbiz. That'll be it for showbiz. My name is Aisha Brian. Do log on to myjournline.com for more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our program.